Welcome back to another edition of uh, Down the Road with me, Joel Heitkamp. We're going to get a chance to uh, talk about a little bit of everything. Uh, you know, the hearings that are going to be going on about the January 6th committee. We're going to get a chance to talk about what could, should, or never will happen when it comes to uh, guns in this country. You know, it, it's a subject that is right out there and brings about as much emotion out of people as you can possibly imagine. So we're going to go down that road. But... You know, a, a lot of what's happening in, in the media today seems to go back to uh, what what's going to happen through the Supreme Court. Now, there's absolutely no question that for, for the rest of my lifetime, there is going to be a conservative and a very conservative Supreme Court. That was, that was um, what happened through the Trump era. If that was your goal by electing Donald Trump, you won. You absolutely won over individuals like me that said, you're going to make a court so conservative that we're going to reverse years of decisions uh, to the point where we think we've gone back into the Stone Ages. But, uh, you know, we need to talk to someone without opinions necessarily on that, someone who teaches it, someone who's a professor. And so Justin Crow is just that. He is a professor of political science at Williams College. Let's bring him in. Justin Good to have you coming down the road with us. Thanks so much, Joel. Good to be here. I want to talk about uh, what I said, uh, which was the conservative court, the look of the court. We're already finding out with the leaked uh, leaked documents and the, and the leaked conversation that's being had about Roe v. Wade. That's one example, albeit a very huge example. But uh, the, the court itself and, and the post-Trump, post this... Uh, you know, this term of Donald Trump, for sure. Uh, what is your take on how this court is going to look and look for a while? Well, I mean, I think you're 100 percent right that if if you elected Donald Trump with the idea of, of creating a conservative Supreme Court, um, as, you, as you said, Joel, you won. I mean, the it was not too long ago that journalists were writing pieces talking about the Roberts court named, of course, after Chief Justice John Roberts, about how Roberts himself was the center of the court and he was the pivot around which things um, focused. And if you had Roberts on your side, you were likely to win. If you didn't have Roberts on your side, you were likely to lose, that he was the pivotal fifth vote. That was not too long ago. And then uh, three Trump appointees, obviously Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett, has really sharply shifted the court to the right. And so now we have a court which um, Roberts is not even the, the center of the court. He's the most liberal member of a six-justice cons six, uh, conservative majority. And so um, most of these individuals are young and will, and will serve for uh, the near, if not into the extended future. And, and we're going to see the, the effects of that coming this term. You mentioned uh, abortion and the potential overturning of Roe v. Wade in, in Dobbs. There are a number of other cases on the court's docket that will be disposed of in the next few weeks uh, that might signal the same thing. So l let's talk about that, because the one thing I don't know if I'm right about uh, is uh, during the, 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 my time here on this earth, uh, whether or not it will be this conservative and very, very conservative court, because obviously that matters when a man that is no longer young, uh, Clarence Thomas, gets off this court. And so if Roberts was the swing vote and, uh, God forbid, something happened to Clarence Thomas tomorrow— uh, and, and he was to be replaced during a, a Democratic administration. Do you see the court going back to being that middle of the road court? Well, so I think the, the first piece of that, and, and I would note that Thomas is only, I believe, 73, so he could easily serve another decade or decade and a half on the court, given um, how long some of some justices serve. The wild card there is even if Thomas were to leave the court during a Democratic administration, you would need, as you well know, a Democratic Senate to have any chance of getting a nominee confirmed, right? I think it looks like we're heading into an era where the, a court vacancy will not be filled unless the president and the Senate are controlled by the same party. So uh, if we had a moment in which a Democratic president, but you had a Republican Senate, I think we're likely to see that seat go unfilled. In the event that you have a Democratic president, a Democratic Senate, Justice Thomas leaves and is replaced by a, uh, a left or even a center left judge, that potentially puts Roberts more in that swing position again than you would have Justices Kagan, Sotomayor, Justice Jackson, um, President Biden's newest appointee, and this new hypothetical Democratic justice serving as four, uh, four conservatives on the other side and Roberts in the middle. So it's not as though it's impossible to change. It's not as though it's a 9-0 majority or something like that. But Democrats would need to 
control the White House and control the Senate and get the right retirement or departure of the court in order to create at least a more balanced court from their perspective. Not a liberal one as in the, the 1960s, but at least a more balanced one. In your classroom, uh, is there ever any conversation about expansion of the court? Uh, do you talk to your students and, and talk about the, the what if scenario? Because it isn't as though history can't provide you with evidence of that. Oh, absolutely. So the, the court, I mean, the court has not been nine members for forever, right? The court actually was, was 10 briefly during the Civil War. It's been manipulated from five to six, seven to nine to 10, back to nine. It, it, it's, it's bounced around for a while, though nine has been stable for some time now. And I think you've seen this, um, you know, the language that has usually been used around this, which dates to the New Deal, is, is so-called court packing. And um, that was FDR's attempt during the New Deal when a conservative Supreme Court was ruling against him to add justices to the court to try to get New Deal legislation approved. Recently, as, as this has become more popular, um, especially on the left, the, the term du jour has become court expansion or court reform. And, and expansion is one way of thinking about ways to reform the court. But it is certainly something that um, I think uh, more liberal students in, in my class and at our college have, have entertained and have thought about as a possibility. Um, as, as you note, it is nine is not written in the Constitution. Nine is set by statute, and that could be changed by Congress at any point. I think some people have concerns about the tit for tat that goes on there. And if Democrats, uh, when they have the presidency in Congress, were to raise the size of the court to 11, that then Republicans, when they took control, would raise it to 13. Uh, and then where do we go from there? Do we just have a, it's kind of the opposite of the race to the bottom in some sense, because it's a race to just a bigger and bigger court. That's not a reason automatically not to do it, and but it, but it is a caution that I think some people uh, sound when we think about these questions of court reform and court expansion. What about conversations in your class room about terms of Supreme Court justices, uh, that, that you, you sit there and you say, look, you're appointed, uh, you, you have no worries whatsoever, but hey, you better do it because you got 10 years, uh, for example. What, what, what's the conversation about that? Yeah, so I, I mean, I think there have been proposals uh, a number of years ago to do 18-year terms, um, with the idea being that every two years, a member of the court, if we have a nine-member court, every two years there would be uh, a vacancy, and that each four-year presidential term would be guaranteed two nominations to the court. Uh, there is a certain appeal and a kind of routinization of that. Um, now, that one's a, a little trickier because uh, by the Constitution, justices hold their office um, during good behavior, effectively life tenure. So there's been some arguments that you wouldn't necessarily need a constitutional amendment because there are creative ways to not deprive the justice of, of his or her ability to sit on the Supreme Court, but to create some sort of rotation where you have, right now there's the, the U.S. Courts of Appeals, the intermediate courts, where you can rotate judges onto the Supreme Court from that for periods of time. That's something that's been talked about. These are all measures um, that is, that is uh, among a suite of measures of what we would think of as judicial accountability. And these things came up in the early 20th century. Teddy Roosevelt and the progressives at the time were big on these, on uh, initiative and referendum and recall, uh, recall of federal judges, possibilities of requiring super majorities, not just five votes, but six or seven votes to strike down an act of Congress, um, making it easier for Congress to overrule a judgment of the Supreme Court. These are all kind of acts of, of political accountability. And if one of the things that you're concerned about is the ways in which the Supreme Court, as, an, as a group of unelected political officials who no doubt wield extraordinary political power, if you're concerned about their unresponsiveness to politics or their lack of accountability to politics, then proposals like this try to balance that scale a little bit. If you're someone who's a little more concerned with, with judicial independence and worries about the kind of corruption of judicial power and likes the idea of a counter-majoritarian check on American democracy, then those things seem a little more problematic. It seems to me that before the appointment of Coney Barrett, there was there was a sense that the court wasn't activists, that that the court was there to rule, that, that it kind of went underneath the radar, so to speak. And after that, the, the debate over whether or not that that McConnell agenda, uh, you know, could could go forward really was over. It was done. There, there's no sense in winning uh, the court or bringing the court back if you're not going to reverse a lot of what happened in the 60s and a lot of what happened in the 70s. And so, y you know, was that the big changing point? Because because really, I want to ask you a, a question about Judge Kavanaugh. 
But it, th this one needs to be first because this is the one that that seems to have pulled the shift. Yeah, so I mean, I think the activism label, right, which which is thrown around by a lot of people. Sometimes it refers to judges who kind of read their own views into the Constitution. Sometimes it refers to to judges or justices who are really aggressive about striking down laws of states or, or Congress. Um, you know, has become a kind of label that people use to describe judges or justices they don't like. And so for the right, I mean, I think I think conservatives would say, like, Joel, come on, obviously activism begins in the 1960s. It begins, or the 1950s, it begins with Earl Warren. It begins with Brown versus Board of Education or Miranda versus Arizona or in the early 1970s with Roe versus Wade. That's the high point of activism. And that all conservatives have been trying to do for the last 40, 50 years is claw back and make sure that the Constitution is interpreted properly. So I think your mileage is going to vary somewhat when you think about that term. Uh, when we're talking about Coney Barrett, I mean, I think what was significant during the McConnell era, and, and Coney Barrett is kind of act two of it. I think act one of it was Neil Gorsuch. Antonin Scalia dies in February 2016. Uh, President Obama nominates now Attorney General, then Circuit Court of Appeals Judge Merrick Garland to replace him. And McConnell will not even give him a hearing. And, and so the, the back and forth of um, they did it, no, they did it between Republicans and Democrats is going on around judicial nominations and confirmations since Robert Bork in the late 1980s. And each side has kind of moments of escalation in that. But McConnell's move to deny Obama the ability to replace on the idea that uh, it's a presidential election year and we can't replace so close to the election that people should have their view was a substantial escalation of that politics. And then what made that so remarkable um, was the turnabout when uh, Justice Ginsburg dies, and I think it is September of 2020, and McConnell all of a sudden has no problem replacing her with a justice uh, six weeks before the election, right? So that was, I, I mean, I for anyone who, who's followed Mitch McConnell's career, I don't think that's uh, particularly surprising. But that turnabout, I, I don't know if it's the, the kind of pivot or the turning point, but it is substantially, I think, a, an escalation in the confirmation wars, making it clear that um, the Senate will approve a judge or justice under any circumstances for a president of their party and perhaps may not ever approve one again for a president of the opposite party. Well, you're still in the rig. It's good to have you back with us here on Down the Road. Uh, Justin Crow is our guest. We're visiting with the professor. He's a professor of political science at Williams College, and we're talking with him about the Supreme Court. And um, a couple more questions, Professor. One of the one of the questions I have for you uh, is about Justice Kavanaugh, and uh, you know that was a highly controversial appointment to the Supreme Court. And that played out. That played out in the hearings and things were said that are not going to be forgotten, very similar to what I remember happening during the Clarence Thomas hearings. Um, that being said, what he answered to specific questions, uh, there are many people, my, my sister included, who think he perjured himself. Uh, that what he said in regards to Roe v. Wade, what he said, whether it was in private or actually what he said at the hearing, uh, really flies directly in the face of what has been leaked that he's about to do, if in fact he does it in a couple of weeks, as you mentioned. Uh, so I'd like your take on that. So, yeah, I mean, obviously the Kavanaugh hearing was a controversial one, uh, not only because he was replacing uh, Justice Kennedy, who was a kind of swing vote on the court and potentially moving it to the right, not only because of the serious allegations of, uh, of sexual misconduct from, from Christine Blasey Ford, um, but also because now in retrospect of what we're seeing about about Kavanaugh's views on abortion. Now, obviously, I, I don't know what what Justice Kavanaugh said to to Susan Collins or to your sister or any other Republican or Democratic senator in, in, in confidence. I mean, I think if he was trying to defend himself on that, he was honest in the hearing and yet could still overturn Roe, he would say something like, I said that Roe v. Wade was a precedent of the United States Supreme Court and entitled to respect under the um, under the principles of stare decisis. He would say, yeah, I said that. I meant it. But stare decisis, the, the let the decision stand, let things stand, the idea that precedent should remain, is not an ironclad commitment, he would say. This, his argument would be, you know, I, I meant it, but sometimes precedents have to be overruled. And if we look back to either the leaked opinion by Justice Alito or the oral arguments in Dobbs, the upcoming abortion case, including some of the interchange between Kavanaugh 
and the advocates and Alito and the advocates, they would say, well, aren't there wrong decisions that need to be overturned? Didn't Plessy v. Ferguson, which um, allowed separate but equal and public accommodations need to be overturned? Didn't uh, Bowers v. Hardwick, which uh, forbade even consensual sodomy among two adults, need to be overturned? He would say, I said it was a precedent. I said it was entitled to some respect. But not every precedent needs to survive, and that sometimes precedents are uh, are incorrectly decided, and it's the job of the court as the last word to say so. I think that's what he would say. That would be his um, his defense of why he was honest then and yet is still doing what he's doing now. Clearly, there are justices, uh, Susan Collins of Maine chief amongst them, excuse me, senators, Susan Collins of Maine chief amongst them, who feel uh, betrayed or lied to or duped by that, um, suggesting that Kavanaugh said one thing and did another. Um, I, frankly, I, I can't express a terrible amount of surprise. This has nothing to do with Kavanaugh, but can't express a terrible amount of surprise that uh, a justice would say something to a senator to get that senator's vote. That's a kind of shock that there's gambling going on in this establishment moment for me. But um, I see why there are lots of people who view that as um, a moment of some sort of dishonesty. Um, but I think it was actually a kind of fairly predictable political turn. So I, wa I want to talk to you about the leak itself, though, sure. uh, because I'm not used to that. I don't know in, in your classroom. No one is how many conversations you folks have had about prior leaks, because I don't think you're uh, used to that as well, and, and you're a student of all this. Um, so, you know, th th there's the obvious what happened, uh, and there's the obvious how did it happen. Obviously, if you're a political family, which mine is, we all have our theories on, on what happened, but uh, the one thing that seems quite consistent in the conversations that we have is that it was a conservative clerk uh, that did this, that the conservative, and that might be, you know, our bias as progressives, but that the conservative clerk was the one that said, this is going to be historic and this is the only chance I have at changing his mind. That being said, I, I still don't know how this happened. Could you ever see a scenario, for example, that a judge themselves leaked this? <laughs> I, I find that incredibly hard to imagine. I mean, it, it seems almost unconscionable to me that one of the justices of the court would leak it. I mean, as you said, uh, Joel, this this is a moment, and there was a piece in, in the New York Times not long after about this. I think it was an Adam Liptak piece about how all of a sudden the court looks like other institutions where reporters run around and try to get um, inside information and leaks. Just this week, Nina Totenberg had a piece, a kind of insider look at what's going on in the court, saying that the justices report not trusting each other and that the place feels like it's a, a kind of emotional powder keg um, and that the tensions are running high. I, I find it really hard to imagine that it's a justice. Um, so I think there are two kind of things to disaggregate here. One is the the novelty, the momentousness of this. So the court is is one of the most secretive institutions in American society. Um, that there are there are classified documents that are seen by many more eyes than a draft opinion of the Supreme Court, which you're talking, I don't know, maybe 50, 60 people um, might have might have kind of primary access to it. That doesn't account who those people might share it with, friends or family or whatnot. Though the court tries to keep these things fairly closely under wraps. And so this was a, a big deal. Um, I haven't talked about other instances of this in class because there really aren't any other instances of this um, to talk about. There was a, a, a tell-all book written by a clerk in the late 1980s, a guy named Edward Lazarus, who writes a book called Closed Chambers, which has some behind-the-scenes details about the clerks getting along and the justices getting along or not getting along. That was um, viewed as a kind of massive shattering of norms around the kinds of things that clerks do and don't tell. Um, but that was after the fact and didn't report things that weren't, um, at least in some sense, in the in, in the public domain. This is is potentially transformative. So there's that on the one hand. And then there's the second. There's the kind of parlor game of of who it was. Um, and I really I, I don't know. I've, I've gone back and forth. My initial instinct was it was a liberal clerk outraged trying to um, you know, manufacture some concern and some mobilization to try to put some pressure on the court or at least to kind of mobilize voters in advance of spring primaries. That was my kind of first instinct. Um, I've since read a lot of stuff that um, that has made some persuasive arguments on the other side, that that it's more likely to be a conservative clerk who's trying to lock in uh, this five justice majority. Chief Justice Roberts is not part of it. And that maybe one of these clerks is worried that 
that Kavanaugh or, or Coney Barrett might be soft, might be squishy on this and is leaking this now. Um, recall that the opinion was dated February and it doesn't get leaked until sometime in April, I think. So that that would have been normally a time in which other opinions might have been circulating and maybe somebody was about to change their mind or had changed their mind. And this was a chance to lock it in or at least to make clear who the squishy one was, who the um, the one who who's betraying the cause was, if it ultimately changes. So I, I've seen both of those arguments. I, I think the reality is we're probably never going to know um, the the. I think it's the sergeant at arms at the court who leads the investigation. And this is not a, um, an investigative figure. It's usually someone in charge of, of keeping the justice state safe. So I think we're unlikely to find out anything substantively on who it was. But it is a massive shattering of norms and, um, I think, frankly, a, a, a blow to the court's uh, credibility. Uh, you know, and that's the other part of the parlor game. Uh, there's always been that conversation of, is it a conservative? Is it a progressive? Who Who is it that leaked this and, and why? Um, the other part of the parlor game, uh, you know, you just spoke to, which is, will we ever find out? And that goes to the Totenberg uh, discussion that you had. Mm -hmm. And if you could take that a step Farther, because Nina Totenberg is about as informed about the court as, as a member of the media as anyone I think we're ever going to find, uh, period. And some of what she wrote is information that you wouldn't think anyone would have access to as well. And so if, if, yep. you, if a person believes that we're never going to find out and then you read the Totenberg piece, I would think that that would somewhat change your mind, that uh, well, there are people talking. There are people talking. I mean, I guess the question is whether we will find out on this. Um, that's one question. And the second question is whether we will find out more about things like this in the years to come. I mean, I, I, it may be that that this is a breaking the seal moment, uh, that that clerks didn't do this kind of thing before. I, I mean, you, you, you raised the possibility, Joel, of could it be a justice? I mean, again, I, I'm still it, it's hard for me to wrap my head around that. But could we get to a point in which justices um, play the media just like members of Congress do or members of the White House do. Um, this, you know, the, the fact that we had the leak and then there has been subsequent kind of reporting coming out in drips and drabs culminating in this Totenberg piece this week um, suggests that we may have a kind of broken the seal moment and that after this, the court may not be quite so tight lipped anymore and may not be quite so um, media averse anymore. And, and that would be just one more step toward making the court look in the eyes of the American people like any other political institution. It is, in your opinion, um, this the Roberts court? In the sense of him being the controlling voice? No, I, I don't I don't think it is anymore. Um, I think it's, you know, whether it's I don't know who it is, because the voice, you know, in the Dobbs opinion is going to be Justice Alito's, it seems. Justice Kavanaugh and, and Justice Barrett have shown an ability to kind of be on the fence on some things. Clearly, on, on one side of it, I think you have Justice Alito and Justice Thomas. Justice Gorsuch can be kind of tricky. Um, he was he was the wrote the opinion in the um, in the LGBT non-discrimination case not long ago, Bostock. So um, he can be a little tricky on some of these. But generally, Gorsuch, Scali uh, Gorsuch Alito and Thomas are kind of the conservative wing, and then Kavanaugh and Barrett are the next two, and then Roberts is slightly more centrist, um, which is saying something because Roberts is a very conservative justice, but slightly more centrist than them. But I mean, I think if you look at the statistics of who has been in the majority the most this term, I believe it is Justice Kavanaugh who has joined the majority the, the highest percentage of the time. And so whether it's him going forward or Justice Barrett going forward, it doesn't look in the current configuration like Chief Justice Roberts is going to be the defining voice here. Okay, so I hung on to him just simply because I find what he's saying fascinating. Justin Carl is our guest. He is the professor of political science at, at Williams College. And we're talking about the Supreme Court. We're talking about this new Supreme Court. And, and I didn't want to let him go until we talked about a couple of things. Security. Uh, and I want to talk about Clarence Thomas and Clarence Thomas's wife. Uh, when the court looks at each other, when, when when you're in a room, at some point, you're going to have to talk to each other. I, I get that. Or, or in fact, do they? Uh, but, but will anybody look at Clarence Thomas the same way when they find him to be the only dissenting vote uh, and, and we, his wife attending a rally uh, to overthrow the government? Now, that's maybe my bias, but I'm sorry. 
uh, her encouragement on, on January 6th uh, to the administration goes far beyond some objective view. And that's his wife. And to say I don't talk to him about that tells me they don't have a very good marriage. Uh, you know, so uh, I guess what I'm asking is, well, the rest of the court ever look at Clarence Thomas in a way where they trust him? Yeah, it's, a, it's an excellent question. I mean, the, the personal relationships of the justices are a fascinating topic. And, the, you know, for a long time, if we go back to it to an earlier age, we go back to John Marshall in the 19th century. Uh, Marshall was this man of legendary wit and charm um, and used to invite all the justices to drink sherry with him on rainy days. And he would he would do it almost every day. And he would say, it surely must be raining somewhere in our vast expanse. Right. And that was a time in which justices often like lived together in close quarters and all of this. And they were very close, even when they disagreed on things. But you fast forward all the way to the to the late 20th century and Justices Scalia and Ginsburg were reported to be quite good friends. They were joint opera lovers. They would spend time together, um, their spouses, so on and so forth. Um, so the justices have had, even across what we would think about as ideological divides, personal relationships. Um, whether the, the revelations about, about Ginny Thomas, Justice Thomas's wife, um, shake that among, among certain justices and raise questions about why he hasn't recused himself or didn't recuse himself, excuse me, from certain cases involving the Trump administration and uh, the Trump campaign's challenges to electoral results and to voting procedures and things of that nature um, is a fascinating question. Uh, I, you know, maybe maybe some clerk will one day one day tell us maybe it'll appear in someone's memoirs. But you have to think that there are, especially in light of the, the Totenberg piece this week, which talks about general tension and a lack of trust among members of the court, that there are probably some for whom that matters. Absolutely. Yeah. If you go into any one of my uh, daughters, my daughters are in their 30s now, and you ask them uh, what they think of Justice Ginsburg, they're going to look at her as one of the great models of, of women in America. Mm -hmm. They're supporters. Uh, yep. You'll see the T-shirts, you'll see the banners, you'll see the magnets on the fridge, all of that. Uh, if you want to see a dad get in trouble, point out to them that one of the reasons I believe the court is made up of and the way that it is now is because Justice Ginsburg didn't acknowledge when she needed to leave. Uh, that during the Obama administration, after her first scare with health, that she needed to take a step back as this, you know, individual uh, with a bigger role than, than one of herself and take a step off the court. They have a hard time admitting that I'm wrong and they have a hard time not saying with emotion uh, that I'm wrong as well. Uh, and I'm, I'm curious what, what you hear from your students. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a, there's a number of students who uh, are torn by that. On the one hand, Ginsburg was towards the end of her life, um, perhaps as, as legally sharp and as legally influential as at any point. I mean, there wasn't, there wasn't evidence as there sometimes is of, of cognitive decline or intellectual decline. She was writing and arguing, I think, at an incredibly high level. Um, yeah, it was a political miscalculation. She said, and you know, people wanted her to re retire ahead of, of the 2012 election. And she made a comment about Obama couldn't get anybody uh, appointed as liberal as I am. Um, well, the result was we got somebody appointed to replace her who was um, substantially more conservative than she was, mm -hmm. right? But far more conservative than anyone Obama would have nominated, obviously. So. Um, I think it was a, a, a kind of regrettable um, decision in retrospect. I, I understood it in the moment, and I understood that justices don't like to be pressured. Um, but the the challenge was that there were there were lives and careers and livelihoods um, more than her own at stake, and I think um, some of the people are are paying the consequences for that, or pay, paying the, or suffering the injuries because of that. Last one, and, and a promise. Sure. Security. Yep. Last question. Uh, you, know, question. It, it, you know. You know. Majority leader or the minority leader of the Senate comes out and talks about the drastic need for security with uh, Justice Kavanaugh, how scary yeah. this is. And and yet we're sitting there with Uvalde, uh, Texas, where mm -hmm. uh, the nation's eyes are on this mass shooting and mass shootings. Uh, and of course, you got one justice scared. So the, the security argument, uh, you know, two, it's a two part question. Number one. Is it legitimate? And I don't mean of something that could happen to them, but something that Congress needs to kick in on right away or, you know, or take action on. Or two, does it play well for the Republicans who are against any form of gun reform? Yeah, I mean, um, one, I, I think security among, uh, you, you know, for, for 
members of government who are not, you know, don't have Secret Service protection is is a real thing. And I think we've seen with the rise of of language of political violence in America. I mean, it was a little rich to hear McConnell talking about it and, and to blame Schumer because Schumer made those ill-fated comments um, some time ago about the, the justices will rue the day, they'll pay for this. Um, but it was a little rich to hear McConnell talking about that given the kind of ways in which the Republican Party has stood by as the escalation of rhetoric around politics has gone on during the Trump era. But I mean, I think there's there's obviously in, in this moment heightened political hostility willingness to to use or to threaten violence such that that extra protection for for members of government who might be involved in these decisions seems seems warranted to okay. me um the remind me of the the second question well, well. The, the the second question i have is how does that play out for the court oh, itself because if all of a sudden if you're the republicans and we got to protect the court we got to protect the court on a national scale you take to the well of the senate and you do that uh you know and then on the other breath you say no to any level of action on gun control, which one is Well, look, I mean, I think McConnell will have it both ways, right? Because he's a, a brilliant political tactician and is good at having it both ways. One of the one of the things that supposedly was motivating the, the person who was coming to harm Kavanaugh was the country's inability to do anything about gun violence, right? So, I mean, McConnell, it seems to me, will use it to say, look, it's not actually, you know, uh, supporters of the NRA who are the who are the truly violent ones? It's people who are mentally ill, and then it's people who are so um, foaming at the mouth, desirous of gun control and taking away Second Amendment rights that are trying to harm people. Right. Yeah. So I mean, I think I think McConnell will figure out a a way to kind of work that in 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 his own advantage. The man um, and I that's think going the, to affect history the most. Uh, Mitch yeah, McConnell. I mean, it, it's been an incredibly influential term as majority leader. We talked about Merrick Garland, yeah. um, but there's been plenty of other stuff as well that um, exactly. that will lead him to down in history as a as an incredibly effective Republican politician, the most effective of this era. I've got to get you to North Dakota. People would listen to you all day long and twice uh, on Sunday. Sounds good, Joel. Professor, thank you, sir. Appreciate Thanks it. Thanks for having me.